Welcome to this quick workshop. My name is Yuchol. Today is a very exciting day for me because, well, as you can see, we get to reinstall the saddle back on this base. It's been about two years, long time coming. But before we can do that, we have to make a new lead screwed nut and reinstall these shafts as well. So let's get started. The lead screw has some wear and I will make a new one at some point. But for now, I need to make a new nut. In the last video, I made this internal threading tool that can also be used for boring and grooving. I also ground up a high-speed steel bit for the ATPI Acme thread in that video, and that's what we'll be using today. The nut will be made out of 932 bronze. It is a popular choice for this application because it is resistant to wear, impact, and easy to machine. The unique finish you see comes from the continuous casting process used to extrude the material at the factory. The finish length will be 2 inches and even though it is sold as a one and a quarter inch diameter, the actual size is big enough so you can clean up the mill scale and still end up with the stated diameter material you need. We're shooting for 1.190, but I'll take it. Used pop cans are great for protecting finishes from the chuck jaws. We will drill out the hole in steps and finish to the correct diameter with a boring bar. 1 inch 8 TPI requires a hole diameter of 0 0.8750 and 0 0.8813 inches and we will shoot for somewhere between. We'll take the first measurement and enter this value into the DRO. I'm shooting for 0.878, which is in the middle of minimum and the maximum values of by two tenths. And since we're not savages, we will chamfer both ends. Since Acme thread has an included angle of 29 degrees, we need to set the compound at half of that, which is 14 and a half degrees. I'm using a magnet to hold the Acme thread gauge and using an indicator to dial in while moving the carriage left and right. And I think this looks pretty good. And using a 1-2-3 block, I can easily square up the tool to the material. 
The blue Sharpie makes it easy for me to see when the tool touches the material. I guess it's time to send it. And it was at this moment I realized the RPM was too high. Fortunately, the depth of the cut was shallow and the damage was minimal. In fact, I can see small scratches on the crest of a couple threads of the finished part, which doesn't affect the function. Uh -oh. After picking up my pride off the floor, I lowered the speed and continued on. What else can you do? I'm checking to see if I'm close, and since the lead screw is long, I had to come from the other end of the headstock. Uh, it's not quite there yet, so a few more passes. And like a cautious groundhog on a chilly February day, the lead screw emerged from the hole. We want to check the fit against the new lead screw material, not the old worn out one and the fit looks just perfect. There's no wiggle at all. This is the new lead screw material. The nut fits on there really nice. There's no play. I'm very happy with that. And for comparison, here's the old nut. Quite a bit of play. Drill the hole partly into the new nut, tapped and used double set screws to prevent the nut from coming loose. It's a tight fit so I don't think it would come loose but it's a cheap insurance. This hole is how the nut and the lead screw get lubricated. There's a one shot oiling pump that distributes the oil to all the necessary surfaces. I cleaned and blew out all of the oil lines and they all look good. We are finally turning our attention back to the saddle and it feels good, it's just been a long time. Now these two shafts move the table left and right and before I reinstall them I want to stone a few key surfaces to get rid of dings and burrs. That will make sure they fit correctly into the saddle. These are collars that go at the front of the saddle. These shafts are press fit into the saddle and it's a very tight fit. I placed the shafts in the freezer for three hours to shrink them but they still needed some persuasion. The most challenging part of this is there are three set screw holes to line up between the shaft and the saddle while I'm pounding it in. The first side went fine but this side wasn't aligned so I had to repeat this install. We are ready to install the front knobs. These are attached to the shafts with number four uh, taper pins. So you just got to make sure we get the right orientation. One side has a bigger hole than the other because it's tapered. It's pretty, uh, it's a pretty loose fit. But before we put the pin, we're going to use tapered reamer get rid of any burrs and stuff I already did it lightly so I'm just double checking right now yeah that's good 
I have all the masking tape here so when it's time to file I don't damage any parts. I trial fitted these and shortened both ends. I'm gonna put a piece of wood underneath it support the bottom of the shaft here. It looks like I don't need to file this end. Yep, we have to file that end. I got it filed down on both sides. It's pretty good. That allows it to be retracted. I already did that side, but I'll save you the hassle of watching me do the same thing over. Hey, it's future me. As I was editing the video, uh, it became uh, obvious that maybe I should explain what some of these controls do. Uh, I think that would make a lot of sense as to why I'm going through the, all the hassle of making sure everything fits. So these two knobs are, well, duplicates. So they both do the same thing. You can stand on this side or that side, front or back, to operate. So what this does is it is a rapid traverse for the table left and right. This rack bolts to the underside of the table and when you pull this out, it engages the pinion gear. So you turn left and right, and so that when you're grinding uh, cutters, it touches, the grinding wheel touches the, each tooth, and you traverse back and forth quickly like that. Now, if you want to go slow, there's a more precise, uh, precision, slow speed the mechanism that fits right here has a planetary gear so when you turn the table moves very little bit. It's uh, for different grinding uh, applications or if you need to feed very precise amount into the wheel that's what you use. But for the most part this is more uh, this is the part you use more commonly. Okay. And right here is where the lead screw goes that moves the whole saddle back and forth. And this cavity right here is an oil reservoir. There's a pump that goes in the front of it. So when you pull the plunger, it feeds oil to all the ways and keeps it lubricated. And the pump inside this connects to this distribution box and all these lines go out to lubricate the shafts, the waist, underneath, lead screw, and everything else. It took a lot of time cleaning all this up. I'm not done yet, but uh, it's pretty complicated. The base has a V and a flat waist, and the saddle will sit on that and travel back and forth. And here's the main head and spindle fits in this hole. The column and the spindle can be turned at any angle. And this wheel you use to raise or lower the head relative to the table. And you can lock everything down when you're ready to grind. And this is what it looks like under the base with the motor mounted. When you raise and lower the column, the entire motor assembly travels with it. It goes up and down. There's also rack and pinion mechanism that helps with the belt change or change of the speed. Mounting that motor was a pain in the butt. There are five bolts that you have to uh, fasten while holding the motor in place. And as you can see, the access is really not good at all. So yeah, I was pretty sore after that. This is the underside of the table. I haven't done any cleaning, as you can see. It's a mess. A lot of grease. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to use grease or oil to lubricate these uh, roller balls. So I have to figure that out. But this is going to take a long time to clean up. These are two different types of work holding spindles. The one on the left is uh, uses compressed air to provide fr uh, frictionless um, rotation. So you got to hook that up to compressor. It looks rough. 
I have to take it apart and see how rough that is. That one doesn't look very good either, but yeah, more fun. These two are grinding centers. So if you need to grind a long piece, you can put it between the centers and rotate. There are a few other accessories. I need to figure out where it all goes. I just got a box of it uh, when I bought the grinder. So I have to figure out what is usable, what is not, and what's related to this versus other machine that we're not going to talk about. Because of the V-way, these stones won't work on their side of the saddle. Fortunately, Kinetic Precision now offers bevel stones and Spencer sent me one to try. They are made with same high quality workmanship and it allows you to stone dovetail ways on a mill, lathe, and anything else where 90 degree stones can't. Using some lightweight spindle oil for corrosion protection, and just like Frank's hot sauce. I put that on everything. That recess is for the retaining grub screw. The original Cincinnati manual calls out for P55 lubricant for the entire machine. And as expected, that no longer exists. But some research shows Mobile DT25 ISO 46 is a good replacement that's readily available today. I don't know about you, but I'm very excited. I feel like I'm finally getting somewhere, seeing the saddle back in the base. I feel like I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I appreciate you sticking around and watching the video. I really appreciate it. See you next time.